around 10 o'clock. Where are you guys? We need to start. Gotta be there in three minutes. What a crowded road. I may be late. I will be on time. Yes, Just start without you. No, no, we're here. We are here already. Okay. Here we are. So now that we all arrived safely with our different modes of transportation, we would like to officially welcome you to our conference on improving road safety in Danube area for all road users. Challenges and opportunities in the second decade of action for road safety, so 2021 to 2030. This is a joint conference of the Radar and Sabrina projects organized in cooperation with the European Union strategy for Danube region. So good morning, or maybe better said, good afternoon to more than 30 countries from all around the world, from where we have received over 220 registrations for this event. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Anja Sorsha, the Sabrina Project Communications Manager at the European Institute for Road Assessment, which is a subsidiary entity of the Eurorap based in Slovenia. It is my honor to be the moderator of this event today. To start the conference, I would like to give the microphone to Olivera Rosi, project director at the European Institute for Road Assessment. Olivera, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you, Anya. Well, dear speakers and panelists, dear participants, let me welcome you to this conference on behalf of project partners from both Razor and Sabrina projects. This event is a very special occasion to us and thank you for joining. We are pleased that you are giving us the opportunity to show you and introduce to you our work for the past two years. It wasn't easy, I must admit. It never is. It's not easy even today, as we would have loved to be with you in a conference room in a beautiful hotel somewhere in Vienna. But we are all here online with so many of you as participants, and this is great. Inwardly, this is our pleasure to share with you all our hard work and successes over the last two years in both projects. Raider, from the implementation perspective, and Sabrina, from the designing and getting ready. I hope this conference is going to be useful to you and will open new or reopen some old channels of cooperation in making roads safer to all users, especially in post-COVID era. I will pass the floor now to our dear Mr. Ferry Smith. Ferry is the chairman of the Eurorap board and director of our institute, and he's based in the Netherlands. Ferry, the mic is yours. Please mute and unmute and turn your camera on. Um, important conference. Uh, it's an honor to welcome you uh, today. And um, I, of course, want to have a special word of welcome to our keynote. Steve Phillips, uh, uh, Conference of European Directors of Roads, and Franz Zepic, the uh, European Union of Strategy and of, for the Danube region. But of course, uh, to all speakers who will share their experience and insights with you during the day. And uh, I must compliment the organization with uh, all the hard work to prepare this, uh, this conference. It's not an easy task, especially not because we are online. Uh, it's a lot more easy if we can meet in person. But uh, I'm very impressed with all the preparations and <clears throat> the work so that we can meet each other. <clears throat> um, 
And I'm of course very glad that you've taken the invitation to join us. Uh, it's good to see that so many people uh, care and want to contribute to improve road safety. We have an important job to do in this new decade, a uh, decade which started with another threatening epidemic, I would say, COVID-19. And that's the reason why we meet online. Um, <clears throat> it's a pity, but we have to do with it. This has an effect on all of us and for sure on mobility. And I will come back to that uh, uh, shortly, uh, the effect of uh, COVID-19 on mobility. But what I also can imagine is that COVID-19 deviates our attention from this other pandemic, I would say, uh, uh, the fact that every single day worldwide, more than 3,700 people, 3,700 people loses their lives in traffic. And in the first decade of action, we have tried to get a grip on this. Uh, we, we worked our fingers to the bones and we did put a lot of effort in this. But in, unfortunately, it's not enough. So we have to, tr uh, to try harder in this next uh, decade. We don't, we, we have to do more. And we have to improve what we already started in the first decade. But we have also uh, to do different things. For instance, we see the global trends of urbanization. It's booming. Many people living on, in a limited space and uh, there's more confrontations between different modalities of transportation. There's a lot of effort uh, also from the automotive industry, the vehicle industry, to minimize confrontations between those modalities. And uh, uh, ADES support systems will help, but it will take at least a, a couple of decades to have a vehicle population which is big enough to expect serious results from that. So we have to work also on the traditional um, ways to improve road safety. And it will be not only vehicles, as I said, but also road infrastructure and uh, the behavior of uh, uh, road users. As a Dutchman, um, I would say cycling is important. In the Netherlands, we have uh, more cycles than inhabitants. To give an impression, we have about 22 million uh, people living in the Netherlands. Uh, sorry, uh, 20, uh, 17 million people in the Netherlands, uh, but we have 22 million cycles. So cycling is popular and popularity is growing. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that the attention cycling gets in this uh, uh, conference, because I think it's a, a very um, important mode of transportation. Cycle infrastructure in the Netherlands is overcrowded. Uh, and there are a lot of consultations on cycle paths itself. And we see an increase as a global trend in cycling. Electric assist is one of the drivers of popularity. But not only uh, the traditional cycles are coming into our roads. You saw it in the introduction movie that a lot of other um, micro-mobility modalities, uh, such as e-scooters, uh, will give us a, another challenge. We can't find place and space on our cycle uh, infrastructure. And let's not forget walking, because whatever kind of modality we take, we're always walking towards it. Uh, so it's the start and the end of our uh, transportation in a day. I promise you to come back on COVID-19 and what we did in the Netherlands, uh, we did some research on the post-COVID effects on mobility. And what we see uh, that uh, a lot of people as an effect prefer personal mobility uh, over the overcrowded public transport. And it will stay. Uh, at least uh, we have a, a, a serious uh, um, survey, we have done a serious survey on that. And we see that at least 20% people who were taking public transport will stay in personal uh, modalities. Luckily, they don't turn into cars, but they uh, prefer walking and cycling in city centers. So that's another reason um, why walking and cycling within cities will increase in popularity. And there's a lot and, and uh, a very big task for us to, to see what we can do to improve this cycle infrastructure. 
I hope uh, with all the people um, uh, and the panelists we have that you have a very fruitful day. And of course, uh, we will do from the Europe uh, point of view our utmost to see where we can support you, how we can help you to improve road safety and uh, especially improve the uh, cycling infrastructure, which is key uh, to the development I described. I wish you a very, very uh, pleasant and fruitful day. And um, well, I'm looking forward to the results of this wonderful um, conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivera and Ferry. Before we continue, here are a few important housekeeping notes. Our conference will last approximately two and a half hours. All attendees are muted, but you're welcome to post your questions at any time during the presentations. You can see the box where you can write the questions on your control panel. During the conference, we will have two questions and answers sessions. We will select the questions and our speakers will answer them for you. If you're addressing your question to a specific speaker or presenter, please note that in the question that you post. This event is being recorded. The video and PowerPoint presentations will be available on our websites after the event and also any questions that we might not be able to answer during the conference. We hope all this makes sense. And before we continue, we would just like to take a quick look at our agenda. First, we will give the floor to four amazing keynote speakers. After that, we will dedicate the second part of the conference to the radar project. We will have short presentation of the Danube Transnational Program, and then we will hear what the project is all about the radar project, of course, and learn about its midterm results. We will finish this part with questions and answers session. The last part of the conference will be dedicated to Sabrina project, which focuses on the cycling infrastructure safety. We have four interesting presentations and five presenters ready for you. And as well as for the radar project, also the Sabrina part will finish with the questions and answers session. So that's it from the housekeeping perspective. And now it's our big pleasure to give the floor to Matthew Baldwin, Deputy Director General at European Commission, Department of Mobility and Transport, and European Coordinator for Road Safety. Matthew, your camera is already on. Please unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Well, good morning. Hello, Anya. Hello. Olivera, hi, Ferry, so many friends from the European, from the global road safety community. And what a wonderful agenda you've set for us today. And as you rightly describe it, challenges and opportunities. It's a rich menu of topics, fantastic diversity of countries and participants. And if I may say, tremendous organization. Delighted to be with you. I'm sorry I'll have to leave at 11, but I'll try. Um, I really want to be able to pick up any questions you have. So fire them at me and I'll try and do them in the chat or, or afterwards. Very, very briefly, because I know how short we are on time. Um, they, I want to come back to this diversity. When I looked at the list of countries involved in the Danube uh, region, eight of them are from the European Union, uh, which is great to see. Three of them from the Western Balkans and therefore part of our new vibrant transport community. And one from the Eastern Partnership, with whom we're also working closely on road safety. So it's a great opportunity, this kind of conference. And I always urge people to think regionally when they're tackling road safety, because you can learn so much and exchange so many different ideas. Ferry's done a great job talking about the numbers already. I just want to draw your attention to one, which is this extraordinary figure of 1.35 million global dead on our roads this year. Yes, in the era of COVID, which is now past, sadly, a million deaths, uh, we have a broadly similar number of deaths on our roads each and every year. Just in the European Union alone, we have 23,000 dead, which I'll use this measurement a lot, accounts for about uh, 51 per million of the population. And let's not forget the 135,000 serious injuries. These are the key numbers. And let's remember that in the era of COVID, we've learned that the public accepts strong public action to protect public health. And that's uh, that we should take as an encouragement to tackle this annual scourge 
of road safety. What are we doing about it in the EU? We have a new EU road safety strategy from 2018, set out in 2019. And when I, in slightly more detail, when I'm off, I will post the links uh, so colleagues can have a look at those glorious documents in their glorious detail. I have no time to tell you uh, about the detail. Now, I want to just stress a few key points. It sets out a plan for how we are going to try to reduce deaths and serious injuries by 50%. Again, these are the crucial measurements when we're looking at road safety. Don't worry about accidents or the number of injuries. We need to focus hard on deaths and serious injuries. We had a 50% target for 2011 to 2020, and we're going to miss that target. Um, but what's crucial to me is that the ministers of the European Union said, okay, we're going to get right back at it, and they've adopted these targets, and we are determined to meet them. How are we going to do it? Firstly, we're going to implement the safe system. Sometimes you hear about that as known as Vision Zero, but um, all the elements you're going to be discussing, I think, during the course of today, it's about improving the safety of vehicles, both in and outside the car. We've made road safety much safer inside the car, we haven't yet caught up really outside the car and the vulnerable road users, which we're going to be talking about, um, we're seeing their safety rates declining slower than those inside the car. So it's great to see Sabrina, for example, looking at that uh, topic. It's about safe infrastructure. So pleased to hear about the, the radar project in the European Union. We've adopted changes to our road infrastructure safety management directive, which we anticipate will save 3,000 200 lives over the next decade. If you think about that numerically, that is almost one quarter of our reduction target. So we're counting strongly on the changes to the Road Infrastructure Safety Management Directive to deliver. Safe speeds is another crucial element of the safe system. We had a great seminar and I see Marco on the line. He joined us for that last week, delivered a great paper. Um, we know that uh, if we can reduce speeds across the European Union by one kilometer per hour, we can save another 2,000 lives. It's probably the fastest way, if you'll excuse the pun, to deliver road safety. It's also about governance, setting up um, a lead road agency, uh, road safety agency. Um, my hat goes off to Serbia on that. You've done a great job. My hat goes off to Austria, who presented to our high-level group your plans for your new road safety strategy. And of course, it's also about post-crash care. So when you look at that list of topics that come under the safe system and it's a very short summary i think you can see road safety the, the road safety injection if you like as a cocktail of uh, ingredients don't let people tell you that road accidents just happen and that fatalities are an inevitable consequence of driver error we know we have the methods to prevent mistakes leading to lost lives and serious injuries um you asked me to say a word about the gaps between uh, different countries. We have those gaps within the European Union and uh, two of the countries in the Danube region, Romania and Bulgaria, have suffer are still suffering the most in terms of death per million in road safety in the, in the European Union. But there's some great progress too. When I look at the list of countries um, joining from the European Union, we have no fewer than three PIN award winners from the prestigious European Transport Safety Council PIN awards. Um, Hungary, uh, uh, Slovakia and Slovenia have all won that award. Uh, special mention to Croatia for the 30% drop in fatalities over the last decade. Special mention again to Serbia for all the best practices you're adopting and leading on within the Western Balkans. Um, and that's how we want to work in terms of addressing these differences. Uh, uh, I want to see uh, eliminating some of those diversities um, uh, uh, in terms of results within the European Union, and we want to work closely with regions like the Western Balkans, the Eastern Partnership, everyone in the Danube region, so that any, everyone can benefit from road safety. We have a project in the European Union we're called, we call the Road Safety Exchange. Uh, Romania and Bulgaria are uh, benefiting from the exchange of best practice with a number of countries who've had more success in the past. Austria is one of the key participants on the, on the donor side, if you will. And we're so excited by some of the developments we see across the region. The transport um, community, new and energetic leadership, terrific commitment to road safety in your new regional road safety action plan, working very closely with us on all of these things. And if I may mention the importance of one thing, it's about data. 
And there, I'm very excited about the uh, work we're doing with the Eastern Partnership countries to develop road safety observatories for the region. And of course, also in the Western Balkans, we will see, I hope, the development of, of a road safety observatory. Put very simply, if we don't measure it, we can't manage it. That's why the data is so important. And if there's one first step we could do, it would be road safety observatories across the region, firstly gathering data on killed and serious injuries, and over time developing more key performance indicators. You've asked me to say two more things. I'm running out of time, so I'll be very quick. On COVID, well, you've mentioned it, Ferry. Uh, massive transformation in, in, in our um, in our transport uh, uh, of, caused by the COVID crisis. We've seen a huge increase in active mobility, walkers and cyclists, that's very exciting. A massive decline in the use of public transport, a huge drop, then a rebound in terms of car traffic. Uh, fatalities went down a lot. We saved within the European Union 1,500 lives during the three months lockdown, but those fatality numbers did not decline as much as the decline in traffic predicted they would. And we think that may be because of excessive speeding, for example, by drivers on empty roads. So we need to learn the lessons from COVID. I think more generally, we need to think about not just road safety, but our entire mobility. And I'm sure we all know, anecdotally, uh, talking to people, we want to build back better. We don't want to go back to the old normal. So finally, what are my expectations from today? Well, they're sky high. I want to hear all about the net safety project, all about the network wide uh, road assessment plans for the region. I will stop here. I will listen for as long as I can stay on the line and I'm looking forward to learning about the rest of the conference. Thanks for your attention. Over to you, Anya. Thank you so much, Matthew. From the Conference of European Directors of Roads, we have their Secretary General with us. Steve Phillips, a warm welcome. The microphone is yours. And please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Anya, and, and thank you for all of the team. It's it's uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Well, maybe not here, uh, but uh, to be with you virtually. Um, I was thinking it was March 2019, so almost 18 months ago, when uh, when we met in Ljubljana for the for the radar project, and, and it was great to see. Um, the exchange between the experts there, and I, I was very, very pleased uh, to be part of that. Uh, just uh, a few words, and, and of course, it's very, very difficult to follow uh, Ferry and, and Matthew, who have already covered a lot of the really, really important and, and, and pertinent topics. But if I can have the, the next slide, uh, just because I'm, I'm sure many of you know who, who CEDAR is, but uh, it, I think it's, it's, it's useful just to, to explain um, you know, we, we, we're not, an, not uh, uh, you know, just focused only on, on, on a narrow interpretation of roads and certainly not focused on a narrow number of countries. So although uh, if you look at the website and everything, you will see 28 national road authorities, soon to be 29. Uh, little Lichtenstein will be joining us. Uh, but overall, and, and certainly on the road safety topics, from time to time, we will we will have 40 national road authorities engaged in our activities. Now that's, uh, I think, a great another example of the great need uh, for cooperation between all the different road authorities in delivering uh, the road safety targets that we need. Just following on from uh, what Matthew said, you know, we, this exchange between the different countries, it's a bit maybe sobering to to to, to recognise that if all countries in Europe were delivering or, or performing as well as, should we call them the best countries, although they often don't think of themselves as the best countries, but if they were all delivering the same safety um, or, 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 or delivering uh, the, the, the same number uh, uh, or the same level of road safety, then we would already, already be at 50%. We would be saving around 12,000 lives per year. So that's a, a good target. But as I say, even those who, who might, others might consider to be the best they don't consider themselves to be the best. And all of this comes down to the question of exchange of information and, and how do we learn from each other. And that's why on my slide, I focus on the men and the women uh, who have the day-to-day -day responsibility of managing our roads. These are the road directors who have the, can I have the next slide please? Who have the responsibility, uh, the challenges, although in this politically correct time, we don't call talk about challenges, we talk about opportunities. So these are just some of the day-to-day -day, uh, challenges that road authorities will have. Many of them you will recognize. I think road safety underpins a lot of these. 
Now, in terms of opportunities, I think, and maybe this, this also comes back to the question of post-COVID and, and, and how we deal with it. The question is, how do we turn what often were considered challenges or irreconcilable differences, uh, competing uh, issues, and how do we turn them into a win-win? So we've heard a lot about the growth of, 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 of particularly of cycling. Uh, and just here around Brussels, you will see the tremendous amount of work that's been go going on by different road authorities, uh, you know, accelerating their plans. Some, some plans that maybe they were thinking, or oh, maybe in five years time, we'll get around to doing this, this, this cycling scheme. And they're bringing all of these plans forward and implementing them much, much faster uh, than we would before. And I, and I think that's, that, that's great. And they're learning a lot of lessons as they're doing these. So this ex exchange of information, and I won't dwell too long on this slide, but I, I, I will again focus, if you, if you look down in, in the bottom right corner, there is the question of the skills, because in all of these issues, again, and I, I'm happy that today we will talk about this, but we talk about techniques, we talk about money, we talk about lots of things. But at the end of the day, this does come down to developing the skills, retaining the good staff, because you know it's still a uh, it's still a tough environment out there. So it's it's you know retaining the staff, and, and we we all know that not only in the road authorities, but also in the the sectors that are important for delivering a good and safe road. So focusing on the people is really really important. My next slide, please. So. When, when, we're, when we're not talking about RISM, and, and lately we talk a lot about RISM, but uh, that, that's, uh, if you like, that, that's a tool we're using. That, that the main focus, a lot, a lot of CEDAR's activities now are really based around four challenges, which were part of our Towards Vision, Vision Zero uh, paper. And you will recognize these. And I think you know, the, these still stand the test of time. They will still be important as we move forward over the next few years post-COVID. Huge emphasis on improving the, ex the safety of the existing road infrastructure. You know, we're not going to throw all this away, uh, but already, you know, we're, we're, we're finding new uses, we're upgrading, we're accelerating a lot of road safety projects now. Matthew's already mentioned the question of speeds. Yes, we have a, a lot of challenges there, physically, politically, legislatively. There's a lot of issues to be dealt with so that we can provide self-explaining roads, self-understanding roads, and all of these things that we need to, to make it easier. Math, as I say, Matthew, Matthew's referred to the fact that speeding, apparent, well, speeding has increased in a number of countries, and that has uh, uh, undermined a lot of the road safety benefits that we might have, might have seen. You know, we, we, certainly from the road sector, we've already seen we cannot rely on the, the, the police uh, as much as we might have in the past. Uh, so the question of enforcement and, and, and all of those things maybe are not there. Maybe they will not be as strong in the future. So how do we bring those some of those issues into the road infrastructure management domain? Improving the safety of vulnerable road users. Uh, I think you, you know we've done a lot of that and I, and I can encourage and support the work that's Sabrina's been doing and I know we won't necessarily be dealing with this a lot today but there is the question of the intelligent transport systems how will they uh, supplement and complement a lot of these activities for example in the question of speed how can we use the new technologies in vehicles or on the roadside uh, to help reduce and, 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 and make sure that we have, we're at the right speed so if I can move on to my final slide because I'm not going to take too long next slide please Okay, so these are some of the outputs, and I, and, I, and I hope that many of you are, are already paying attention to these. These are, you know, we, we, we've, we've gone out, we've commissioned work from many of the best, the, the world's best research institutes, uh, who've developed uh, to, uh, documentation on a wide range of activities, ranging from incident management, how to deal with accident prediction models, issues such as stopping site distance, not munching on the slide, big focus on roadside advertising and, and how do we deal with those issues. So there's a, there's a huge uh, um, amount of information out there which, which I hope you, know, you, you, you will uh, take the opportunity to, to, to look at. Uh, we're, you know, this, this is all freely available. We share this with all of the road authorities. Uh, we're looking for the, the other road authorities to add uh, to this, uh, to this, 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 this uh, library of activities. And if I can just, just do a little plug, we have right now an, an open call. We're, we're soliciting pr proposals uh, for calls on safe, smart highways. So again, that's firmly within 
it within the domain uh, that you're looking at. And, and I want to stress, this is not only for the Western European countries. You know, we're looking for these solutions that fit for the whole of Europe, because like my countrymen before me, I think, you know, you, you can see that we're very passionate uh, about supporting and, and, and bringing together all of Europe and getting all of Europe to work together for a, a safer um, more greener and, and, and prosperous future. So with that, I, I, I really uh, you know, look forward to the in exchange that we'll have during this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Steve. So we also have Franz Zepic with us today. He is a coordinator of the Priority Area 1B to improve mobility and multimodality of the European Union strategy for Danube regions. Franz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anya and uh, dear Oliveira, Lina, Matthew, Steve and Ferry, dear speakers and participants. I understand that in these challenging times that forced us to meet virtu virtually, uh, I regret because normally I believe that uh, a lot can be done during the coffee breaks lunches or uh, informal working dinners, because this is the key for exchange of uh, experience and our views. However, the times are not uh, at present allowing us to do so. I'm also very glad to welcome you as a conference entitled Improving Road Safety in Danube Region for All Users. It has been now almost 10 years since I and my colleague from Serbia, Mr. Poledi, the State Secretary, our project management team, steering group and steering group members are trying to support, facilitate and contribute to mobility and multimodality in the macro region. Road safety activities are of particular importance to us. And I'm happy and thankful to great number of stakeholders that are contributing to our endeavors as well. For many years, the Eurorap is one of them, and we have been friends since probably my times in Brussels back in 2004-2003. The Danube macro regions, as already met, you mentioned, is um, spreading on a wide area from Black Forest in Germany to the Black Sea in the east. It is home of 115 million inhabitants. It is composed of 14 countries. Quality and size of road and bicycle network varies between them. Motorization differ. Average age of vehicles differ. And of course, road safety differ. One of our main tasks is to work on narrowing gaps in the field of transfer between these 14 countries. And this includes a road safety as well. Dear participants, every year I'm making over 20,000 kilometers by car and up to 1,000 kilometers by bicycle, commuting to my work, going to long distance business or holiday journeys. And every second on the road or bicycle route, I'm potential candidate to make a mistake. A second of lack of concentration, distraction is enough, an accident can happen. This is true for every driver, every cyclist, and I, regret to, and I regret to say also to you. For this reason, and because most of the accidents or incidents has been attributed to the drivers in the past, and it is true because the studies uh, claims that we are making 90% of them. I have been very happy that in 2005, on the level of EU, we got the first directive, directive related to the infrastructure. And this was directive on road safe, on safety in tunnels. And then back in 2008, directive on road infrastructure safety management was published in November after the agreement between the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. As you know, last year, this um, directive has been amended and its scope broadened. And again, this is a great move towards the contribution of infrastructure for the road safety. 
to keep traffic moving, to make it efficient, sustainable, safe, and secure, we need to make joint efforts. In order to improve road safety, we need to develop and use the right, sorry, we need to develop the right measures to enhance to enhance the safety of, of all road users. Our common goal should be to experience the benefits of road and bicycle network that will enable us to move efficient, safe, and secure between all the Danube region countries and beyond. That's why we need to pay special attention when planning infrastructure projects across borders. High standards for quality and safety should be the same in all countries, all over the world, all over the Europe. Coordinators of the Priority Area 1B aim to promote, to facilitate, and to contribute to safe and sustainable mobility system also in coming years. Dear participants, we are here because we know that transport doesn't stop at borders. We are aware that we need seamless transport networks that enable safe, smart, and sustainable transport system. It's time to move forward to exchange best practices and to work together on the road safety of the future. I look forward to hearing the results from the two projects, Radar and Sabrina. I'm sure that both projects will contribute to safer roads and safer bi bicycle routes in the Danube macro region and beyond. And I believe the theme of the conference, Improving Road Safety in the Danube region, will remain high on our everyday agenda. Like Matthew, I'm going to listen carefully and to learn from all the speakers, all of you. And I believe that you are going to learn as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Franz, also to you. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from another keynote speaker. This is Lina Konstantinopoulou, Secretary General of the European Road Assessment Programme. Lina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya. Dear moderator, uh, dear chairman, thank you. Dear Matthew, Steve and Frank, first of all, uh, I'm really honored to share the panel with you on such an important topic like road safety. And again, thank you very much for your participation to our conference. My keynote speech will only complement your views and your advice for strategic directions to meet uh, the European Commission goals to, to, in order to save lives, but also to launch the second decade of uh, action on road safety. Of course, many of you have tackled the issue of uh, COVID crisis, which really had an impact on transport and mobility for all of us. And some cities and regions, uh, including, of course, Brussels here, are accelerating their mobility plans. And we are noticing a lot of ad hoc funding programs and single routes of infrastructure upgrades for cycling and walking. We also understand that there is really a tremendous pressure on funding at different levels. We cannot escape uh, noticing that this new trend of the cycling infrastructure has been transformed, as Ferry said, into a micro-mobility infrastructure. And these, these lanes are now used also by bikes, scooters, and many other forms of micro-mobility, giving more and more accidents on the road. But when roads and motorways are designed and built, they are not done in one neighborhood at a time. We don't build just a few kilometers of track and then leave 10 kilometers of gaps in between. The road infrastructure needs to be safe, safe for all road users, vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcycles. And we believe it needs to be designed proactively and reactively in terms of road safety, but in a common and objective manner. We as Eurorap, we have just recently published a position paper on advocating for more road safety investment on the infrastructure for cities and regions. What we are mentioning in that paper is that we need to focus on the most cost-effective actions, such as road maintenance upgrades, pedestrian footpaths or bike lanes, and with a focus on higher risk intersections. So tackling road safety, requires a holistic approach and a responsibility, as Matthew said, on the safe system approach. And that brings to the next point. When we are developing national road safety strategies, 
And I'm putting here also another element. What about urban road safety strategies that are integrated within the sustainable urban mobility plans? We need to heal, we need to think about implementation mechanisms. There I'm directing you to the 10-step plan for safe road infrastructure that has been recently been um, uh, published by the UN Road Safety Fund, which is designed to provide to countries and cities with a proven step-by-step -step on for building national capacity to achieve UN Sustainability Goals Target 3 and 4. And there we see a lot of interesting uh, implementations. At Eurorap, we are creating this type of partnerships and we are really promoting them. And so far we have, uh, I'm happy to say that we have built this type of partnerships in more than 20 countries all over, the, all over Europe. The RADAR project is going also to provide some examples of road, uh, national road safety strategies for safer infrastructure. Eurorap is addressing the challenges that Steve said uh, with respect to uh, road authorities challenges by developing evidence-based tools like crash maps, star rating, to inform and shape investment and also to improve pedestrian and cycle safety. Eurorap uses these tools in order to track progress towards the Vision Zero targets. For these reasons, we have published our road safety KPIs for infrastructure, and there is particular KPIs for even cycling and walking. Now, let me also go back to another point, very interesting point that also Steve uh, captured in his speech, is about training. If we have to really implement these national road safety strategies, we need people to be trained. And we are happy to announce the launch of a new project which will focus on establishing a European Road Safety Academy for road safety infrastructure and will be based on the explodable results of RADAR. And this is an open invitation to our colleagues from CEDR to work with us to make this European Road Safety Academy a success. Partnership for us is key. We are partnering with road authorities and cities to undertake road assessments at the 10T network, primary and at urban level, with respect to the implementation of the, of the RISM directive. We're working in partnership with financial institutions like the European Investment Bank for targeted investments in one to two star roads. We are really pleased to also to do partnerships with other associations. And at this stage, we would like to say that within the Sabrina project, we are planning to integrate two existing assessment methodologies like the Eurovelo and Eurorap methodology to deliver an integrated bicycle infrastructure risk assessment methodology for future use. And also to enable our users to select strategies for bicycle road safety improvements. Let me conclude that again, technology is great and big data and artificial intelligence will play a lead role in building the social and economic business case for safer roads and it will save lives for that and we have been doing quite a lot of things within our IRAP innovation framework for that. On this note I wish you all the best for the upcoming discussions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking, looking forward to meeting you in person sometime soon. Bye. Thank you very much, Lina, and big thank you once again to all the keynote speakers. It's really a big pleasure to have you with us today. Did you know that your safety is on our radar? Not the one measuring your speed. We are talking about the project radar. It is co-founded by European Union funds and it runs in the framework of the new transnational program. Anna Leganel will tell us a few words about the program. Anna will join us with the audio. So Anna, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning everyone. Um, I'm the project officer from the Danube Transnational Program and uh, the person designated to monitor the implementation of the transport-related projects, including uh, RADAR and Sabrina. Um, one of the objectives of the Danube Transnational Program in terms of transport is to contribute to a safer transport network through joint cooperation of appropriate actors in the region by improving frameworks and transport solutions and by providing the necessary training to build and sustain national regional and local capabilities of competent bodies, as well as sharing experience and knowledge with regard to effective road safety programs in the region. 
Transport safety is an aspect which is taken into account by all transport-related projects financed by the Danube Transnational Program, but Radar and Sabrina are the two projects specifically and exclusively focused on the improvement of roads, of safety of roads as commonly shared by drivers and cyclists, as well as other more recently added types of users. Uh, even though we are aware that uh, these two projects will not change the situation dramatically in the region all by themselves, I'm certain that they will bring a significant contribution to road safety as many trainings and national consultations are planned alongside the development of action plans for the improvement of road safety and implementation of pilot actions which will serve as examples and best practices for further actions. According to the data published by the European Commission, there has been a decrease of 23% in the number of fatalities in car accidents in EU countries during the past decade. I hope that Rada and Sabrina will add to this percentage in the years to come when the impact of their actions will finally materialize. Road safety is about infrastructure, vehicle safety, driver's behavior and emergency response. Therefore, road safety is a shared responsibility which requires concrete and joint actions of the road builders, the automotive industry, the emergency response bodies, the local and regional authorities, the national decision makers, and last but not least, the civil society. The, the two projects might not have such a broader presentation, but they certainly facilitate the cooperation between road safety boards, the automotive clubs, the transport specialized institutes and associations, local authorities and civil society, which represent, let's say, the soft counterparts as compared to road builders and automotive industry. But this doesn't mean that they are doing a less important part. On the contrary, sometimes it's easier to build a road than to find a common ground agreed by different types of organizations, not to mention organizations from eight or nine countries, or to educate people when it comes to driving and proper use of transport network. So for the next year, we are looking forward to the results of the RADAR project, and I would like to take this opportunity to wish Sabrina Consortium also a smooth implementation of the project despite the current circumstances created by the corona crisis. Remember that safety is a fundamental need of people, right above the need for food, water, warmth and rest, according to Abraham Maslow, you know the pyramid, and safety is essential for us as societies with a view to achieving higher goals. I would like to thank you very much for allowing me this short intervention and I wish you a fruitful meeting. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much. Well, I believe we are all aware of the fact that our lives did change in the past months and we are living in kind of new reality. How all this is, affect is affecting some of the road safety questions, we will see in a short video in the next minutes. On March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. With nearly every country in the world battling the COVID outbreaks of the virus, our lives have changed dramatically. It has implications for nearly every area in our lives. Road safety is no exception. As we head into reopening in many areas, our experiences during quarantine will shape our thinking and planning for years to come. 2020 is a game changer for road safety. I see governments all around the world celebrating brand new three star and better roads for pedestrians, for cyclists, for motorcyclists and for vehicle occupants. It's vital that we remember just how important is funding for those road infrastructure safety upgrades, including in the Danube region. Every life is important, every life counts, and we already have the knowledge and the tools to save lives and reduce trauma on our roads. I think this is a historic moment uh, when cities can change course, direction. Now it's time to reclaim uh, streets from cars to create safer infrastructure for people who walk and bike. 
we need to pay special attention to the conflict points where cyclists are most exposed to the risk of being hit by motorized vehicles. We hope this is a tipping point for revolutionizing our transport system and it's something that we're working towards to have the provision of safe, attractive, joined up networks throughout the EU. The involvement of all levels of stakeholders together with engineers in proper planning of cycling infrastructure is one of the key ingredients for success on the way to safer bicycle routes. Countries with poor quality roads, vehicles with few ITS safety features and road users that are not complying with regulations, this is where you see more and more the relationship between speed and accidents. Roads should add yet another layer of safety by actively enforcing those safe speed limits. For example, by applying section control, which is actually a surveillance of average speed along longer road sections. I expect the evolution and not the revolution in the implementation of smart speed management infrastructure. If we apply the shared responsibility principles the way it was demonstrated during the pandemic, we can certainly achieve less speeding and improve considerably global traffic safety. So the message to the communities is to create safer infrastructure around the schools. That means speed limits and speed management, and also sidewalks that have to be clear, pedestrian crossings and signals are going to be crucial to have safer areas around the schools for our kids. We need more calming measures, such as low speed zones, bumps, raised crossings, and of course, all of these supported by better enforcement and education. This will allow us to create a legacy of livable, healthy and safe communities in a world where our children can travel safely to and from school. Be respectful, considerate and responsible in traffic. as we could see, but also many, many more opportunities. We have met Olivera Rosi already at the beginning of our conference, and I'm passing the microphone again to her as she will tell us a few more words about the RADAR project. Thank you, Anya. Uh, welcome again from my side. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible as we are uh, a little bit uh, behind the schedule and I will try to present you in five only minutes about the Radar project and I will try to explain why Radar project is strategic and why this is needed to demonstrate what has been achieved so far uh, to present you who we are and highlight what will make it success. Radar stands for Road Assessment of uh, on Danube area roads and my colleagues after in the presentations after will uh, demonstrate show you uh, some of the important key results that we have achieved so far but before we go to this uh, I just wanted to uh, explain with just one look why uh, we need the radar why radar is needed in the region the, here are two maps uh, road death per million inhabitants in 2010 and in 2019 uh, in both cases, uh, the Danube region, the region in which Radar project is implemented, is performing uh, much uh, less effective than other Western European countries. From so, from the European perspective, Radar project is addressing also a big gap uh, between the infrastructure safety uh, in infrastructure safety between countries of the. Uh, different countries in the uh, EU. Also, RADAR is a strategic project. It has uh, objectives, strategic objectives. We will try, we try, we will contribute to improve the capacity to identify and reduce risk on roads. We, we are also fostering transnational cooperation, exchange of experience and know-how, and we will also demonstrate road safety layout concept solutions that we are going to test and 
uh, deliver in our project. Uh, this strategic objective uh, aims to improve performance. Improve performance of stakeholders. Radar project is addressing uh, national road authorities, national transport ministries, road safety engineers, and all the other local, national, and regional stakeholders in each participating country that are involved in building safer uh, road infrastructure for all. All this uh, improving performance uh, targets that we have set will find their place and will be underpinned in the Danube infrastructure road safety improvement strategy and action plan that will be delivered during the project. In brief, in first two years, we are now um, in the final phase of the implementation of the project and uh, these yellow, yellow boxes on the screen are those things that we are going to deliver and speak about today. Uh, but I would like briefly to just note a couple of uh, important things that we have delivered so far that paved the way uh, to, our, to the presentations that you will uh, be uh, able to see later on by my colleagues. Uh, we have delivered a road safety procedures training concept. Uh, it was delivered by Survey on Need on status report of the infrastructure safety level in Danube region countries. We have delivered a training syllabus and what is the most important thing and somehow uh, goes in line what Lina said about uh, uh, the needs on training. All training materials and software had been translated to seven principal language of the partner countries. That means that uh, all uh, our participants, all stakeholders in different countries, which are not very, most in many cases, not very fluent in English or not very uh, familiar with using English for their work, have now their training materials, syllabus, and the concept in their uh, uh, local languages. That helped us a lot to deliver a three day training sessions in eight countries on uh, in local languages. Uh, after that, we have delivered uh, four webinars that uh, have unfortunately been online due to the uh, COVID situation. And these four webinars have been focused on four uh, thematic areas that we are uh, tackling in Radar project, uh, which are safer road investment plan, vulnerable road users, ITS and speed management, and road safety near school. I could see from the uh, keynote speakers and especially from uh, Steve that uh, these uh, four topics are going quite in line with what uh, CEDAR is doing on road safety in general. And we are very pleased that we have had Steve here and we are also pleased that all of you have participated in, as experts in our road safety aspect groups. Uh, in this road safety expert groups, we have worked quite a lot uh, by meetings or virtual or exchanging communication and material in uh, collecting the information and delivering reports that you can see on the screen under the road safety expert group. Uh, these reports are all uh, on four thematic areas that you will, uh, that are going to be presented to you later on. All these reports and the recommendations from the reports will be underpinned into the Danube Road Safety Improvement Strategy and Action Plan that is coming soon, actually coming uh, being ready to be delivered uh, approximately at the beginning of the next year. What is very important here with this road safety strategy to mention uh, is that uh, we are having, uh, we are expecting, and this is this has been announced that uh, this Danube infrastructure road safety improvement strategy will be endorsed by all our associated strategic partners that I will present in a minute. Before that. I would like to uh, just uh, provide you a links with resources that you will be able to find on this uh, in these slides. Uh, these are the places where you can find what you have delivered so far, what we have delivered so far, and uh, all the details. Uh, of course, everything is on our website, and these are just specific links to specific topics that you can. Uh, uh, watch later on because of the time we couldn't uh, deliver them all together now. Uh, where Radar is going from now on and in the next seven months uh, until the end of the implementation. Uh, we are going to uh, deliver 
four pilot actions in seven countries. Each pilot action is referring to a thematic area that I have mentioned before. Safer road investment plan, um, vulnerable road user protection, um, uh, speed management, uh, and ITS and uh, road safety near schools. Uh, after we have delivered these uh, pilot actions, which are in progress, we have had some delays, to be honest, the, due to the COVID, but it seems that we will be on track uh, at the end. Uh, we are going to evaluate them and to include all the results of these pilot actions in four thematic area reports and their recommendation that will be presented to you later on by my colleagues. At the end, as I said, the most important um, output of the project that will hopefully bring results in the years to come is road infrastructure uh, improvement strategy and action plan in each country. This will be very briefly about the implementation work packages of the project's radar. Uh, I just would like to show the project identity. Uh, the, uh, the project will uh, last until the May of um, will end May 2021, and uh, it's very important that we really appreciate all the partners that participate in this project and that have worked very very hard on the delivery of the results so far, and all the associated strategic partners, many of them. 13 uh, from all the countries, being mo mostly being uh, Ministry of Infrastructure or Transport and Road Authorities that are on board with us, that are helping us with suggestions, providing our, us information, and they are happy to endorse the strategy after the end of the project. And finally, what will make uh, Radar a success? And I just found one quote that actually summarizes everything. A vision and strategy aren't enough. The long-term key to success is execution, each day and every day. Or in other words, in Radar Project, no life is saved. We didn't achieve our goals until life is saved and until the implementation on road infrastructure improvements are in place. Thank you very much, Anja. Back to you. Thank you, Olivera, and thank you for staying within your five minutes. As Franz mentioned already at the beginning, and as Oliveira just did, yeah, every day, each day, we are on the roads. As vehicle occupants, motorcyclists, cyclists, or pedestrians. And it is important to be and to feel safe out there. Jure Kostanschenk from Automob Auto Automobile and Motorcycle Association of Slovenia will explain us how to target infrastructure spending with safer roads investment plans. Jure, the floor is yours. Hello, hello to everybody. Of course, uh, the most usual question is uh, funding of the improvements in road infrastructure. Uh, do we have uh, road safety funds? How do we spend the money? How do we plan the spending of the money? And if do we spend the money uh, wisely? Uh, next slide, please. What we studied in thematic area one is uh, among our 10 partner countries, whether or not do these countries have uh, uh, dedicated special road safety funds to make uh, uh, road safety upgrades on a uh, road network. What we learned, the majority, there is no dedicated road safety fund, and we're present, some of them in Moldova, Austria, Czech Republic, and Slovenia. Uh, there are no specific reports after, afterwards how the money was used directly for uh, road safety uh, upgrades or what were the benefits of that implementation. Um, we also learned that about <coughs> half of the participating countries in RADAR project use some EU funds for road, road infrastructure uh, upgrades at this moment. Uh, also, what we learned is that uh, money is distributed ad hoc. We didn't see uh, or notice any systematic approach, no prioritization. Next slide. What is the road safety road investment plan? This is a project. This is one of the delivery of the uh, uh, road assessment. Uh, namely, we have a, a risk rating of the roads. We have star rating on the roads, and based on star rating, the outcome is an investment plan. So for our inputs, which may road survey of the existing roads or uh, uh, road designs of the roads to be planned, uh, after coding of road attributes through processing in the VITA, uh, VITA tool, uh, we receive star, star ratings. And based on star ratings, the outcome is an investment plan. Um, it 
tells us, it shows us what um, measures to take, how this day will cost, what would be the benefit, what would, what is the best, what is the benefit to cost to cost ratio, and uh, um, we also know that. Uh, there are differences between countries, the, the statistical value of life and the cutter measures are calculated in relation to local costs and the values. Uh, next slide. The example, how does this look? Uh, the example should be, uh, this is the, uh, another slide uh, with uh, uh, measures, examples. Uh, we may select uh, from the list of about 90 different proven countermeasures worldwide which may be used at some specific uh, road where there's some specific problematics and topics which is not okay for example shoulder widening uh, um, central hatching uh, 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 steel barriers or the, any kind of barriers on the road and the selection of the measures within the procedure is uh, set by some triggers and it's uh, selected from a different combination of about 300 trigger sets the system calculates the potential of the lives to be saved uh, uh, lives or uh, serious injuries and also we can set the minimum uh, benefit to cost ratio. Next. <clears throat> this is the example. How does the result look like? So for one specific road in, in, in question, with analysis or a road network, whatever is the, our um, scope of work, we receive uh, the, the list of potential measures which may be used to, to upgrade the road, road safety on the specific section. Um, we get the, the estimation of the uh, fatalities and the serious injuries that could be prevented in the 20-year plan period. We get all the financial estimation, the cost, the benefits, cost per person saved, uh, per, per life saved, and serious injury saved, and the benefit to cost ratio. So it's very in-depth, detailed, uh, systematic approach to uh, road safety upgrade and the smart uh, funding, uh, the best possible investment. Next. So what we get, we learn where uh, where the most affordable and where the most cost-effective measures are to be taken and to be done. We uh, learn, we get estimation how many uh, deaths and serious injuries could be prevented, avoided. We get the economic overview, economic benefit of the plan, and also the cost of it, of course, in a 20-year uh, period. Uh, we get the estimation of the cost per death and serious that could be avoided. And of course, we can uh, analyze this on the entire network or on a specific road section in question. Uh, we delivered, next slide please, we delivered recommendations. Uh, we delivered prepared recommendations at three levels. So one level recommendations is for a national government, second level is for local governments, and the third level would be for, uh, for road authorities. Um, on the level of national governments, of course, of course, <clears throat> We want to make them understand that also a specific road safety fund allocated uh, budget should be should be uh, planned for a specific road safety intervention. Uh, on the second level, we want them to start with a safe system approach uh, um, uh, to the road safety to the road safety uh, uh, of the, uh, their roads uh, in general. We want them to have uh, uh, continuous trainings of road safety auditors. Uh, we also want them to transfer, so national government to transfer the uh, safety system approach and also the knowledge with uh, uh, good practices to the lower levels of the, let's say, local governments. And also um, next to, let's say, motorways, um, first level state networks, we also want to have this uh, approach uh, had, uh, transferred also to the regional loads, regional loads level. Next. The recommendation for uh, uh, local governments, uh, this is different situation. Uh, the one that we would uh, suggest to start with is at least to start with the systematic road safety data collection. And based on their data, they will be able to perform analysis and then later on to plan interventions, investments, uh, again, on the most critical locations which need um, uh, attention uh, as soon as possible. And the third one, so the recommendation for road authorities, they also, of course, are responsible for the maintenance in sales. Uh, they may or may not have uh, their own uh, special individual road safety funds, and we do encourage them to start thinking also for special, really, to uh, safety upgrade uh, uh, um, funds, which uh, will enable them to make direct road safety upgrades uh, uh, in terms of road safety equipment and our, uh, different measures. Again, where the locations with where the measures are the most effective. 
Um, they also want them, so we also want them or we suggest them, recommend them to follow the, the latest uh, developments, latest trends in road safety and the latest good practices around the world. The knowledge database is quite wide and uh, it's, it's accessible. We have internet, we have uh, uh, also our pilots and then they may see what, what, what might be our suggestions. And also what do we want them is to use the methodologies for selecting most critical locations with highest potential savings. So the money will go uh, uh really where it's needed thank you thank you very much jure for your presentation all of us were or we are on daily basis in the role of vulnerable road users who are they and what can be done for their road infrastructure safety Bojan Jovanovic from the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Transport and Traffic Sciences, has the answers for us. Bojan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anja. Hello, good morning, everybody. So in this presentation, I will say a few words about uh, what can we specifically do in order to improve vulnerable road users' infrastructure safety in Danube area countries. So uh, here, uh, for the beginning, uh, I will say a few words about vulnerable road user accident characteristics. Uh, as you can see here on the first slide, uh, during the last decade, we actually have a reduction in uh, pedestrian and cyclist fatalities in the uh, Danube area countries, and the average reduction of fatalities over the last 10 years is 21% uh, for pedestrians and 80% for uh, cyclists. And also, as you can see from the two maps shown here, the annual pedestrian fatality rate varies significantly among the Danube area countries uh, from uh, 8.2 to 36.8 accidents per million inhabitants, uh, while the annual cyclist fatality rate varies between uh, 2.9 and 8.4 accidents per million inhabitants. Also, uh, the results of the performed statistical analysis have also shown that on average, 27% of the total number of road fatalities include pedestrians and 10% of the road fatalities include cyclists. So can we now go to the next slide? So here, uh, we can see that the most of the vulnerable road users fatalities occur in the urban areas, what is of course as expected due to the fact that uh, urban areas have most intensive pedestrian and cyclist flows, uh, which are on main, uh, many, many locations in conflict with the motorized traffic in urban areas. And also, it was determined that uh, the underreporting of pedestrian and especially cyclist fatalities is a significant issue in all of the Danube area countries. And of course, this issue needs to be resolved uh, with linking the existing road uh, traffic accident database with the available hospital data. Uh, regarding the age groups that are uh, the most involved in the very use accidents, uh, they primarily include children 11 to uh, 18 years uh, of age and elderly more than 64 years of age. So please, can we go now to, to our next slide? Uh, here we can see the main uh, three main methods uh, which are used for uh, vulnerable road user risk assessment in the uh, Danube area countries and they include uh, visual identifications based on road safety inspections, Eurorap star rating procedures, and black spot management procedure, procedures. And these uh, three main procedures uh, basically use uh, three main uh, safety uh, assessment indicators, uh, which include uh, crash rates expressed as the number of pedestrian and cyclist fatalities and serious injuries per kilometer of road network, crash rates expressed as the number of pedestrian and cyclist fatalities and serious injuries per million vehicle kilometers traveled, and additionally the traffic accident unit costs are also used for the purpose of performing cost-benefit analysis. And of course, uh, based on the performed uh, research in the radar project, uh, we have also determined that uh, 
um, many of the road traffic accident databases in most of the Danube area countries do not include all relevant data necessary for performing precise statistical analysis of pedestrian and cyclist accident characteristics as well as for performing the countermeasure selection prioritization and implementation process. And we can go to our next slide now. Here on this slide, we can see how uh, the countermeasures for pedestrians and cyclists are selected and prioritized in the most of the Danube area countries. So uh, the most often, the countermeasures are selected based on uh, field investigations performed by a road survey team at critical locations on the, uh, on the observed road network. In addition to that, many different uh, subjective criteria are used and a proposal from other stakeholders are also considered. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis is usually performed only for uh, large projects. So one of the main problems is that the Danube area countries do not have standardized official methodology which is used for countermeasures selection, prioritization and implementation process. Also many various political and legal barriers exist uh, that still, of course, need to be resolved in order to optimize the entire countermeasure implementation process. And please, can we go to the next fli slide? Uh, so here, finally, on this uh, last slide, we have the overview of all recommendations by which we can increase the safety for pedestrians and cyclists in the Danube area countries in the future period. So as we can see here on this graph, the recommendations are classified into six main groups. Uh, so in order to increase the very use safety, we need to implement safe system concepts, multilateral approach to road safety in all relevant legislation, all stages of the road planning, design, construction, and maintenance process in all road uh, safety audits, assessments, and projects, which will be uh, performed in the future, as well in all very use countermeasures selection criteria. Uh, secondly, it is necessary to harmonize and align all relevant legislation and remove all legal barriers in existing national laws, in-country regulations, subnormative acts and ordinances related to very use. Thirdly, we need to develop unified yeah. protocol yeah. for vulnerable road users risk yeah. assessment so it is necessary to have an official standardized methodology with objective road safety indicators which all the new barrier countries could use in order to assess the safety of pedestrians and cyclists and to obtain results which are comparable between countries. Also, in addition to that, we need to standardize countermeasure implementation process. This means that all countermeasures should be selected based on the objective criteria and the cost-benefit analysis and that in the countermeasure selection, prioritization and implementation process, the ADT, pedestrian and cyclist peak hour flow volumes, the operating speed should also be considered. Tactical urbanism, space-wise planning and additional inputs from stakeholders should also be taken in account. Also, we need to develop or restructure and link relevant databases. So road traffic accident database should be linked with the hospital data in order to minimize the underreporting issue. All the relevant supporting data like uh, AADT, pedestrian cyclist, pedestrian uh, peak hour uh, flow values and operating speeds and the relevant characteristics uh, of the pedestrian and cyclist facilities should be included in the database and periodically updated. All data sets should be freely and easily accessed by all stakeholders and new analytical software for analysis of data contained in these databases should also be developed. And finally, uh, we need to improve traffic culture and raise public awareness. This can be, of course, achieved by conducting trainings uh, for children in kindergartens and schools, performing national campaigns and conferences for uh, pedestrians and uh, for vulnerable road users and by uh, disseminating all relevant information to the public by various media sources. So basically this is it. I thank you all, all for listening and I come back to you, Anya. 
Thank you so much, Boyan. Before we continue, a kind reminder for our audience, you can still ask your questions, just type them to the question box that you can see on your control panel, and also a kind reminder for all our presenters to keep your presentations in the framework of five minutes. Thank you very much. That we will be able to see all these questions coming from the audience, we have to say thank you to smart technology. It is all around us in the modern world, right? But are you also familiar with smart speed management infrastructure? From KTI Institute for Transport Sciences nonprofit, we are welcoming Gabor Power. That will explain us all about that. Gabor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. I will talk to you about ITS and other techniques for speed management, improving road safety, which is the third thematic area of Project Radar. Speeding is one of the major accident risks on our roads, and it is considered as the main cause of road traffic accident. In this slide, uh, you can see the speed limits in different countries of uh, Project Radar. When we talk about speeding, many people think that it only means that someone drives over these legal limits. But in fact, this is called absolute speeding. This is what uh, can be measured. But what really a problem and the real accident causes is the so-called relative speeding. It is when the driver chooses a speed that is not in accordance with the circumstances. This can happen even if the applied speed is below the legal limit. But for example, the road is slippery, the weather, the visibility or the traffic conditions are bad and so on. It is a scientifically based fact that speed has a direct influence on crash occurrence and severity. With higher driving speeds, the number of crashes and the crash severity increase disproportionately. Uh, Thematic Area 3 of Project Radar focuses on producing a roadmap for implementation of specific techniques and ITS solutions to reduce the risks arising from the inappropriate choice of speed. Therefore, the main aim of an effective speed management strategy could be only the decrease of the speed in a differentiated way. Thank you for uh, going on this slide, Oliver. This is good for now. Speed management is a strategy for controlling speed through a comprehensive, interdisciplinary and coordinated approach that encompasses behavioral enforcement and engineering elements, uh, such as improving the design process, applying appropriate speed limits and other measures. In this slide, uh, you can see some speed management techniques. Uh, in the examples, there are uh, advisory speed posting, vehicle activated speed display signs, variable speed limits, traffic calming techniques such as installation of speed humps, speed signs, raised intersections, roundabouts, and so on. And of course, speed enforcement and its different solutions like speed checks by mobile or fixed cameras, section control. Many case studies prove that uh, the decrease of speed limits has a positive effect on road safety and on the number of severity of road accidents. At our road safety expert group meeting in Budapest, we had the opportunity to learn how great achievements could have been reached by the use of uh, section control in, for example, Austria or in Great Britain, related to the decrease of vehicle speeds on highways. Go on the next slide, please. In our pilot action in Hungary, we have examined the effects of vehicle-activated uh, digital speed displays and speed limit signs, as well as the fixed side speed cameras. We have carried out uh, measurements at eight different locations and devices and found some significant uh, effects. In case of vehicle activated speed displays, two seven kilometer per, uh, per hour decrease in speed was measured 50 meters in front of the device. And from there, a further two three kilometer per hour decrease until the line of the device. The effects were especially good when not the speed, but the speed limit was shown by the display. Uh, fixed cameras uh, had even greater effects. 18, 20% decrease in average speed could be observed. Next slide, please. As a result of the information gathered by uh, radar partners and through the radar training, study visits, pilot, road safety expert group meetings, and the literature review, uh, we have elaborated a so called recommendation sheet related to speed management which will be also the part of the Danube Infrastructure Road Safety Improvement Strategy of the project. 
It consists of uh, recommendations for state governments, ministries, agencies, uh, suggesting, for example, to to define a national minimal standard for the safety of existing and new roads based on internationally recognized methodologies, to elaborate guidelines for intelligent transportation systems, speed management and traffic calming approach, and to ensure embedding of the safe system approach, uptake of good practices, and so on. Next slide, please. Recommendations for local governments have also been defined, highlighting, for example, the need of collecting uh, road accident and speed data for analysis and planning of investment interventions. And the last slide, please. Finally, uh, we have set up uh, some recommendations for road authorities also, related to the consistent and systematic review of speed limits and the need of effective and frequent speed enforcement. Maybe the most important task is to elaborate a guideline which makes it possible to define the appropriate and differentiated speed limits in relation with the function, traffic volume, traffic structure, alignment of the road, and so on. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much also to you, Gambor. Well, the time flies, right? It's already October and at least in Europe, the school started a while ago. I believe we can all agree that road infrastructure safety is especially important and crucial around the schools. How we are dealing with that in the Danube region will be presented by Stelios F. Statiadis from Transportation Solutions. Stelios, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, depending on which time zone you are watching uh, this conference. Uh, hereby, I would like to uh, present uh, the basic outputs of uh, the thematic area for uh, road safety nearby schools from the radar project. Next slide, please. Um, as uh, the previous uh, speakers uh, mentioned, the speed is the most crucial factor in uh, road safety, but especially for uh, uh, schools due to the children and uh, sometimes they are not paying attention to the road and uh, they are not so careful. The speed is the most crucial factor that we should pay attention around schools. So uh, in order to manage uh, the speed, we have different uh, we have different measures, even uh, traditional or state of the art, starting from just regular signs, but uh, then we can have flashing signs in order to attract the attention of the drivers. Depending on uh, the environment and the country and uh, the uh, approach that the drivers uh, use, the traffic code, uh, there are more issues and uh, more measures in order to, to decrease the speed near uh, schools so there we could have uh, dynamic uh, signs we could also have speed humps in some countries or in, in some areas drivers uh, do not pay attention to the measures or to the signs so we have to force them to to me to decrease their speed so we can uh, have uh, a narrow narrow the width of the traffic lanes we can uh, raise the pedestrian crosswalks we can even raise the level of the intersections what it matters is depending on the on the environment, on the country that we are talking about, because there, there is a whole bunch of measures in order to uh, in order to manage the speed. In this report, which is very analytic and detailed, and it is, uh, as Olivera said, uh, at our site, you will find a library, uh, along with pictures, I do not want to take much time here, uh, of what measures, uh, depending on the area and depending on the, 
on the school and I will uh, show you a little bit afterwards uh, how we can uh, ma manipulate these measures depending on the area. So other uh, engineering strategies that uh, we have is uh, the warning signs uh, which is uh, even traditional or with some uh, flashing uh, uh, elements. Parking management is very important around schools due to the visibility at the intersections between uh, the drivers and also the other users of the road. The road crossing uh, measures, typical, uh, elevated, uh, with traffic lights, etc. And bicycle safety, also about uh, micro mobility. Now that e scooters are around uh, in our new reality, uh, all of these have to be tackled and around school. In our next slide, uh, you will see that uh, there are the elements of the uh, the measures and the countermeasures and uh, the, whatever you are trying to implement, it has to take into account the density of people. Uh, and this is, uh, this is just a sketch saying that you have to, to implement different measures in front of the school, around school in a block, and then you have to select the routes where uh, the most students uh, use in order to approach uh, the school. Uh, all of the measures have to take into account the student's age, meaning um, you cannot uh, uh, have the same measures for a kindergarten school or for a high school. And why is that? Because at, uh, at uh, the age of 15, 16 or 17, the kids might go by themselves uh, to the school, watching their mobiles, not paying so much attention. But on the other hand, when we are talking about kindergarten or primary school, then the kids are going either uh, by foot with uh, their parents, guardians, or by car. So in some cases, the cars have to approach uh, the entrance uh, of the school. And also, uh, we have to take into account some uh, stopping of the vehicles, even for some minutes. Uh, all this, uh, it is uh, very important. Uh, and you see an example at the next slide. It is uh, very important to, to, to adapt in the environment uh, in uh, each country. And these uh, features are not only applicable to the radar uh, around the radar area, uh, Danube area countries, but it could be worldwide uh, applications. And of course, everywhere adapting. And in order to, at the next slide, we will see a tool that uh, you, someone can use, which is uh, free to use as a tool in order to measure the effectiveness of its, uh, of its um, countermeasure, of its uh, element, the feature that you want to implement in the area of the schools. Uh, the star rating for schools is a free tool in the internet. Um, where it is very easy to use. Of course, there is a guidance at uh, the site uh, in order to measure the effectiveness of uh, the measures around schools. Uh, at the next slide, uh, we have, uh, as all of the thematic areas uh, in the radar projects, we have the recommendations for each stakeholder uh, within a country. And why is that? Because we, we need collaboration. We need the assistance of uh, each one. So in this slide, uh, we see about the state authorities that um, we have come up with a list uh, what it should be implemented by the state authorities. And it is to develop and support specific design guidelines for road sex sections in the vicinity of schools in order to have a tool, in order to have a guidance uh, for the other stakeholders. Define in the road traffic code special speed limits to be applied on road sections at the vicinity of schools. Uh, ensure adequate funding for road safety interventions in primary 
roads, in the vicinity of schools, uh, ensure embedding of the safe system approach, start systematic collection of data, because as Mr. Baldwin said at the beginning, we need to have the data in order to know what issues to tackle, systematically estimate and publish key performance indicators on road network around schools, transfer safe system approach to local governments and local authorities and also to school directors, support knowledge transferred with demonstration of good practices uh, and as, as I said before, adapt uh, relevant to the environment of each school. At the next slide, we see the, say, the relative recommendations for local governments, which is to ensure adequate funding for all these interventions, to, to start a systematic collection of data on road crisis near schools, because especially in the area of uh, Danube, there are uh, uh, some uh, uh, missing data, uh, very sensitive uh, for schools and for young uh, pupils and organize educational campaigns to promote safe uh, transport to and from schools, which is uh, very important according to the uh, different ages that uh, go to the different uh, school levels. At uh, the next uh, slide, we finally see the recommendations uh, for road authorities, which is uh, to form a known special road safety fund within regular or investment funds dedicated for direct investments in road safety. It is very important whenever we have um, uh, issues uh, to tackle around uh, schools to have the uh, available funds. And actually, Actually, this is uh, one of uh, the main problems uh, in the area that we identified, the lack of funding. Uh, follow the road safety trends and good practices to plan maintenance and upgrade of exi existing road network in the vicinity of schools. Use appropriate methodologies to identify hazardous locations near schools. Take into consideration uh, the parents' associations that uh, they face uh, every day the same uh, uh, road safety problems and they can uh, be of assistance to the road authorities and conduct before and after studies in order to find the, the, most, effective, uh, me the most effective measures to implement. Uh, that is uh, the basic findings. The whole report uh, is uh, at uh, the radar side. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Anya. Thank you very much, uh, Stelios. And so we've came to the last presentation in this radar project section of the conference, where Marko Shevrovic from the European Institute for Road mm -hmm. Assessment will talk about the new region infrastructure improvement strategy. Marko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya, um, for this opportunity to present our work in the radar project and the Danube region infrastructure improvement strategy and AOE. EU SDR and how our uh, radar project aligns with the revised reason directive. Next slide, please. The area covered by the EU strategy for Danube region stretches from Black Forest in Germany to Black Sea on the Romanian, Ukrainian, Moldova border and is a home for more than uh, 115 million inhabitants. The Danube region strategy addresses a wide range of issues. And these are divided among the four main pillars and 12 priority areas, as already mentioned. And those four pillars are strengthening the region, connecting the region, building prosperity, and protecting the environment. Next slide, please. The priority area 1B, to improve mobility and intermodality on rail, road, and in the air, is dedicated to supporting efficient freight movement and travel times on rail, supporting fully functional multimodal 10T corridor networks by 2030, supporting the development of efficient multimodal terminals, as well as supporting improvement of the regional air connectivity. EU SDR is here also to facilitate the improvements of secondary and tertiary roads and to support safe and sustainable transport and mobility in the region where the focus of our projects, Radar and Sabrina, lies. Next slide, please. Transportation is all about mobility. If there is no mobility, there is no transport. But if we would not have transport, we would have limited mobility. And that would limit our possibility as a society. I believe I do not need to talk about the importance of the mobility for the economy, especially now in this COVID crisis. 
That's why now more than ever, we need to understand the importance of efficient and effective transport system and fast and overall safe movement of people and goods. Next slide, please. Radar is all about implementing of the safe system approach. From origin to destination, our travels are on infrastructure. And this infrastructure needs to be provided uh, with the level of safety if one of the other system fail. So uh, having uh, the need to have five-star drivers obeying speed limits and traffic rules, and the aim for them to be driving in a five-star cars that would provide them advanced support, reducing the probability of those drivers making mistakes, and saving them uh, by active and passive protection if a crash should occur. In radar, we are working on achieving a five-star mark on our road infrastructure for all road users. Next slide. In that sense, recently we got a revised RISM directive that is a systematic follow-up in developing well-established RISM procedures to achieve road infrastructure safety improvements necessary for meeting the union's road safety objectives. It introduces a concept of periodical, fast and efficient network-wide road safety assessments that should be followed by either, um, uh, that should be targeted on uh, road safety inspections or in a cost um, efficient direct remedial actions aimed at reducing the road safety risk without too much administrative complications. It is also important to note that the implemented procedures should allow the level of road infrastructure safety to be compared across the union. In radar, we are addressing just that, transnational cooperation and sharing of knowledge and study visits and much more. Um, next slide, please. Network-wide road safety assessment in radar through training courses and implementation of internationally recognized network-wide road safety assessment procedures based on the IRAP or EUROAP procedures we have educated more than uh, 200 road safety experts on how to perform visual examination of the design characteristics of the road and their built-in safety. We have shown how analysis, analysis of sections of the road network, which have been in operation for more than three years and upon which a large number of serious accidents in proportion to the traffic flow can be performed. It is worth to note that the directive is asking for these procedures to be implemented by 2024 and should be carried out at least every five years. Next slide. The radar project is doing just that. Through our four thematic areas, we are focusing on general road section safety and maintenance upgrading using safer road investment plan. We are also focusing on provisions for pedestrians and cyclists. We are focusing on traffic calming approaches through ITS and speed management, and a very important topic of infrastructure safety of roads in the vicinity of schools, as mentioned before by, by our four presenters. Uh, in radar, our training studies, uh, uh, trainings and study visits, thematic area reports approved by our road safety expert group will lead us to develop a Danube infrastructure road safety improvement strategy and action plan that has already been drafted and will soon be presented to all national stakeholders through the network of our partners. Thank you for your attention and Back to you, Anya. Thank you very much, Marco, for this efficient presentation. Uh, since you are a little bit behind the schedule and since we received a lot of very interesting questions during all these presentations, we decided to skip this questions and answers session and we'll try to do our best if the time will allow us to answer those questions at the end of Sabrina project. If that will not be the case, we will post all the questions and the answers on the web pages after this event. So you're more than welcome to visit them and to read the answers there. So as you can see on our agenda for the second part or the last part of the conference, we have also some data and information about the Sabrina project ready. There will be four presentations and five amazing speakers that are ready for you. You know, in Europe, we are catching the last sun rays and of the summer or better said autumn, maybe before the winter will come. And maybe it's time to stretch our legs a bit, right? So we will take you to a virtual study tour to nine Danube area countries.
the bike many times you can be faster it's healthier and also environmentally friendly sometimes just a nice and a safe bike kind of Pedestrians actually are not allowed to use this and so they do, you know, due to the fact that they do and the fact that there are plenty of cyclists moving here there are these collisions What you see here is one of the bottlenecks of Eurovelo number nine through Vienna. Less than one and a half meters wide and used in both directions. One of our Eurovelo routes is Eurovelo 13, the Iron Curtain Trail. It crosses the Austrian-Hungarian border a dozen of times, and it's leading through a rural area that has been very well preserved by the Iron Curtain itself. But with its character, it lacks a highly developed cycling infrastructure. The trail uses mainly low traffic public roads, forestry roads, and it has some challenging parts since it's crossing medieval inner cities, and also high traffic one and two digit public roads. So you could see that uh, along the Iron Curtain Trail there is still a lot to be done in terms of transport safety.
Thank you for joining us on this bike journey. Sabrina will make sure there will be no fears about safety on two wheels. Are your legs stretched? Are you energized and ready for the last part of the conference? We are, and we honestly hope you are too. Now, when we have a bit of feeling how the infrastructure looks like in different Danube area countries, cycling infrastructure, of course, we would like to hear what is the municipality perspective about the challenges and needs of cycling infrastructure. That's why we're welcoming Bostian Prims from municipality Lirska Bistrica from Slovenia. Bostian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anja. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bostian Prims. I work as project manager at municipality Lirska Bistrica. Uh, municipalities differ in size, population density, spatial conditions, and size of urban cyclic infrastructure. Therefore, uh, I would like to present the characteristic of our municipality. Next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, municipality Lirska Bistrica is set on the south of Slovenia. It is the second largest municipality in, by territory but it's sparsely populated with density of only 28 inhabitants per kilometer. Inhabitants are dispersed in 64 settlements. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, three main transport corridors cross municipality from central Slovenia and Italy towards the Adriatic at the south. Traffic corridors increase the traffic load through settlements, which worsens traffic safety. The situation worsened after, after the EU accession when traffic flows intensified. The undulating terrain and lack of dedicated infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians discourage people from using sustainable modes of transport and encourage the use of cars. Next slide, please. Uh, key challenges of traffic management apply to all similar rural municipalities where in the past where there was no need to build dedicated infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians due to lower traffic loads on the roads. Uh, rare settlements, hilly terrain and congested roads encourage residents to use a car, which is then used for shorter distances that could be covered on the foot or by bicycle. Uh, due to the lack of infrastructure, people prefer to drive this, their kids to school. Consequently, the kids aren't used to sustainable transport when they grow up. There are always enough free parking spaces in smaller towns, so there is no need to use alternative transport. Due to the widespread use of the car, there is no demand for public transport services and consequently no adequate service in, is enabled. For the same reason, long distance public transport is not efficient, and in turn, this affects even greater need for a car use. Inadequate and fragmented infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians discourages users who do not feel safe in traffic. Next slide. Uh, these challenges were not initially noticeable, but the increase in traffic, uh, they are increasingly reflecting the quality on the living environment. Thanks to the incentives of the state and European Union, we started with measures to change habits and improve transport in infrastructure. Uh, a major change was the uh, construction of the town bypass, which withdrew transit traffic from the center and thus enabled a different arrangement of uh, traffic areas. We started the process of traffic planning through the development of sustainable urban mobility plan. It gave us a broader view on the uh, uh, on the decision that we make and how they reflect in the uh, organization of traffic. To slow down the speed of traffic, we replace the intersections in the town with roundabouts. Later, we place a bicycle lane on the road, which further narrows the carriageway and thus uh, has effect on further reducing the speed of traffic. Next slide. Uh, 
uh, in the Tau Center, we managed to implement the desired infrastructure from SAMP, which is in the upper left picture, uh, to the implemented roundabouts and bicycle connections shown in the other pictures. Next slide, please. Uh, when planning a cycling network, several principles must be considered. The cyclist overcomes the distance by his own strength, is exposed to external influences, and is also very, very vulnerable when considering the speed of travel. Uh, the network must not extend the travel distance from point A, point A to point B, so they can travel to the shortest and flattest route possible. Contrary to previous requirements, the network must run in such a way that the bicycle connections are secure. Convenience and attractiveness of the routes encourage cyclists to use them regularly. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Well, uh, when planning the routes in town of Ilerska Bistica, we plan them in such a way so that the main cycling connection marked in blue, uh, Anya, uh, the slides aren't changing. We will try to solve this in a minute. You can uh -huh. continue, okay. Bustian. Uh, well, the, the, the main uh, route was planned in the way so that, uh, okay, this marked in blue uh, is linked to side routes that connect uh, different residential business and central areas and nearby settlements to the city center. Next slide. Uh, uh, and other way. Uh, long distance con uh, cycling connections are placed by national government with cooperation from mun municipalities. Uh, because of the limited resources for building the infrastructure, the routes are initially planned on the low, low traffic roads and will later be improved. Long distance cycling routes will also serve as connection to the nearby settlements with the town for the daily commute. Next slide, slide please. Uh, when building the cycling network, municipalities face several challenges. The biggest challenge represents building new infrastructure inside already urbanized space when this kind of infrastructure was, wasn't predicted. When planning a new route, we must consider existing infrastructures like roads, sidewalks, sewer, water supply, etc. This makes it, makes it difficult to place a new road, especially when considering the principle of directness, safety, convenience, and attractiveness. Then there is a, cha a challenge of limited resources that are always in the short supply, especially fullness for uh, land purchase and building, as well as staff needed to manage all the procedures that accompany the construction. State administration receives many initiatives from large number of municipalities, which also causes delays, and they are also limited by the uh, resources. Uh, special, spatial planning and land acquisition procedures are time consuming, so cycling networks must be planned in years in advance. In the process of planning a bicycle connection, it is also necessary to take into account the lack of experience of designers who must plan the cycling infrastructure differently from the infrastructure intended for the cars or pedestrians. Uh, regardless of the challenges, in recent years, we have become increasingly aware of the importance of adequate, safe cycling connections, both at the level of municipalities and at the level of the state. More and more resources are being devoted to solving this problem, and the state is also encouraging appropriate planning by adopting technical guidelines. I believe that our project will also contribute with the exchange of experience and sharing knowledge. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Anya. Thank you very much, Bostian. 
Well, maybe you remember from the video that in the framework of Sabrina project, we are planning to inspect approximately 5,000 kilometers of bike routes in order to be able to tackle cycling infrastructure issues. To be able to do that, we need some kind of methodology. Which metho methodologies already exist will be explained by Alexander Buczynski from European Cyclist Federation and Marko Shevrovic from European Institute for Road Assessment. We already met him a tiny bit before. Alexander, the floor is yours. Please turn on your camera and unmute yourself and you each have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, could we move on to the next slide? I would like to give you a very quick introduction to the Eurovelo European Certification Standard. First, the Eurovelo network is a network of European long distance cycle routes. Currently, includes, it includes 17 routes with the total length of 90,000 kilometers. And uh, more than 20,000 of these routes uh, we have surveyed we, using the same systematized uh, European certification standard uh, methodology. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, and when you think about a European cycle route, you might have this image of a beautiful, uh, perfectly even asphalted cycle path, uh, very well separated from cars and uh, going through attractive landscape. But as we have seen in the introductory video, the reality is uh, much more complicated. Uh, next slide, please. We have sections of the routes that go on busy roads shared with heavy traffic. We have sections that go on uh, quiet country lines. We have also sections where the surface uh, really needs uh, to be improved a lot. And we have really provisional connections with just two planks and a shortcut across the field to connect to two existing sections. And to capture all this uh, diversity, all these different stages of development into some common denominator, we developed this European certification standard. Next slide. And to capture the different uh, levels of development of the route, we divided the criteria into the target groups and the criteria into three main levels. Uh, first, we have the essential criteria, which address the needs, the basic needs of the most uh, experienced of most fit cyclists. Then we move to important criteria, which uh, make it uh, the route acceptable for maybe 30 percent of the population and then we have additional criteria which uh, address the the biggest uh, the the widest the widest target group you can think about families with children or people using uh, some special bikes for example with some uh, hand bikes for people with reduced mobility or or traveling on tandems next slide mm -hmm. The criteria are much wider than road safety. They are organized around three pillars, infrastructure, services, and promotion or information about the route. Uh, but of course, road safety plays a very important role, uh, especially in, this, in the area of infrastructure. Four out of uh, seven uh, main things that we check are related to uh, road safety. But we look at bigger picture because we think that if, uh, if we, if our, even if a route is perfectly safe, but it doesn't meet the other criteria, people will not use it. People will uh, choose an alternative, maybe not so safe route. Uh, next slide. On practical level, the surveys are done by trained inspectors. Uh, we ask them to cycle the route. It's important for us to capture the user perspective, the user experience of the route. And they cycle the route, they stop from time to time and enter uh, information about the, the different aspects of the route. We register around 60 different uh, parameters, uh, for example, route component type, whether it's a cycle path or a public road or a painted lane or maybe an um, agricultural uh, road, uh, traffic volume, traffic speed, surface material, surface quality, width. There are also 
it's also possible to register uh, point uh, points of interest such as chicanes, poles, other obstacles on the route. Next slide, please. This uh, this is this then of course can be put on a map and uh, summarized to 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 see what the inspectors found out of the route and this is uh, a view I consider most useful for for planning actions you can see the the route with the level of uh, compliance with uh, criteria so the the green uh, the green sections are already meeting all the all the criteria all the defined criteria the orange ones are still need improvement to qualify for the additional level and you can see in the labels the different uh, issues that need to be resolved to be to move to the next uh, to the next level of certification next slide and of course you can see you can also summarize the results on wider scale so this is these are the results of the big survey of the Eurovelo 6 Danube cycle route that we have done uh, two years ago now in 2018 in the frame of another Interreg uh, Danube uh, peer project and uh, you can you can summarize the level of compliance with criteria to to track progress or to 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 see what are, what are the priority areas where the, where you need you need to uh, focus your actions and I think I can hand over to Marco now. Marco, feel free to unmute yourself yes, and yes. continue. Thank you, Alexandra and Anya. Uh, again, I'm also glad to have this opportunity to talk about uh, Sabrina and how we implement to assess cycling infrastructure. Next slide, please. It is worth to uh, remind ourselves about the statistical fact that 50% uh, of most severe road traffic crashes and fatalities uh, occur on only 10% of the road infrastructure. From this, it is obvious that not all roads carry the same risk and that by examining the cause and the consequences of road crashes, we can get some insight on what can be improved in terms of infrastructure. Additional to that, uh, we know that speed in function with mass and uh, deceleration, rapid deceleration, is the main cause of injuries uh, to all road users. And conflicts uh, between, uh, at intersections uh, of users between big differences in speed and mass are to be avoided uh, in order to prevent those injuries. Next slide. So we uh, basically know where people are being killed and uh, how those crashes typically occur. Uh, they are usually runoffs, uh, happens or collisions at intersections for cars and traveling along road or intersections by cyclists or pedestrians. But we also know how to prevent those crashes. Uh, safer roadsides, uh, median barriers, cycling uh, lanes, uh, bicycle facilities, and of course speed management can help us reduce fatalities and injuries but only if implemented at right locations. Next slide. Next slide, please. To find those locations, infrastructure risk models were developed and most of them having a basic building blocks consisting of likelihood of crash initialization, uh, severity of injuries when a crash occurs and the influence of traffic flows distribution multiplied by the distribution of that risk to individual users are the building blocks of those uh, models. So next slide please. So why cycling safety is important? If we speak about the numbers we can uh, see that within the EU almost 2160 cyclists are killed each year which translates to near uh, almost eight percent of the road traffic fatalities within the EU. Additionally to that, um, 262,000 cyclists sustained serious road traffic injuries in the period of eight years between 2010 and 2018. Next slide. 
A big part of the current problem is that in many EU member states, the road infrastructure has not been designed with cyclists in mind. Most of the countries started addressing the growth, uh, the growing need for cycling infrastructure and are now attempting to implement adequate measures. Next slide. The importance of that is obvious when considering road depth reduction per user road group. If you look at the graph, graph, you can easily see that cyclists are the only road user group where little or no progress has been recorded in the past years. Next slide. Personally, uh, an eye opener for me was learning about the shocking fact from developing countries like the Netherlands, where in 2016, first time in history, more people were killed on bicycles than in cars. Next slide, please. As this trend continues, compared to the past annual reports in Netherlands, cyclist road deaths are still on a significant rising trend. And this is the problem what, which we will be addressing in Sabrina. And this was, I would say, um, a, 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 a leading idea behind implementing a project like Sabrina in the Danube area countries, since the road safety trends uh, in the Danube area are following those ones from the, let's say, more advanced countries in terms of road safety, like the Netherlands. Next slide, please. So that's why in Sabrina, we will evaluate um, the assessing cycling infrastructure using the IRAP method and combining with it with other existing methods so that we can provide an insight of the state of infrastructure safety presented in an easy to understand format using stars on it or, or a similar uh, um, easy to comprehend way to uh, evaluate or to uh, uh, rate the uh, safety at infrastructure. Next slide, please. IRAP methodology takes into account purpose-built facilities for bicyclists grouped into seven categories. So we have none where there is no facilities. We have signed shared roadways. We have extra wide tracks outside main carriageways. We have dedicated bicycle lanes or roadways, shared use path, or segregated bicycle paths and segregated bicycle paths with barriers. And IRAP evaluates them compared to the actual bike flows on those inspected routes. Next slide, please. Further to the standard or so-called full IRAP methodology, a special fork of the IRAP road safety model uh, was developed. It's called the cycle wrap and it's being developed alongside urban wrap and light IRAP models that are being also developed to reduce time and effort needed to perform a road infrastructure assessments. Next slide, please. First developed in 2016, CycleRap model version one contained approximately 36 attributes collected on every 25 interval, uh, 25 meter intervals at the road network. After which CycleRap model was updated and now holds uh, approximately 67 attributes. During 2017 and 18, pilot tests uh, have been conducted and those pilot tests reveal that the model is difficult and time consuming to implement. So I have decided to review the model and make a new recommendation. Now in 2020, the work has begun on a version two development. Next slide. The cycle up vision is to be able to identify and address cyclist specific infrastructure risk regardless of road and facility type. And among the objective is to ensure that the model is based on research and evidence available. Um, and it should be simple to understand and that it should cover all infrastructure risk related to cyclists. In the end, cycle wrap tools and software should be intuitive, cost effective and easy to use and deliver free of charge to suppliers which can tailor the end user tools and services to the local needs. Next slide. Cycle wrap target groups aligns with those one identified in Sabrina, covering all cycling conflicts and crashes. The special focus is to deliver tools and methodology to transport and urban planners, micro mobility, sharing service providers, school communities, policy makers, and of course, health, and, uh, health services and insurance providers. Next slide. In the future development, having in mind other methodologies, 
as explained by other speakers before me, Sabrina will integrate two existing assessment methodologies, the Eurovelo ECS and Eurorep, and deliver a simple and cost-effective cycling infrastructure risk assessment methodology for futurers. Next slide. Thank you for your attention and back to you, Anya. Thank you very much to Alexander and Marco for these presentations. Well, we've heard uh, multiple times today already, it's my, now time to react, right? Since there are still a lot of places where we can improve in regards to cycling infrastructure safety. But let's be honest, there are also some great examples out there, right? Best practices in cycling infrastructure across strategic planning and engineering levels will be presented by Klaus Machata from Austrian Road Safety Board. Klaus, the mic is yours. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you for the privilege to speak here. Hello, everybody. Well, we have already heard that um, the quality of our cycle networks determines by large their, their safety and the attractiveness of cycling as a mode of transport, which becomes ever more important these days of COVID, these days of climate change. This is why we uh, introduced also uh, a best practice collection uh, amongst many other things here in the Sabrina project. Uh, on my next slide, however, I would uh, like to uh, contest, to challenge, so to say, the uh, principle of best practices, um, asking you that can there ever be such thing as best practice? I mean, who, who of these, whom of these gentlemen would you rank best, or would you rather go um, for the lady on the right? But be aware, I'm asking for evidence-based decision-making, facts and figures. See, not very easy, not very easy, even if you make a decision for one of these uh, gentlemen or the lady. There could always be a better one, and if not now, then maybe in the future. And the same is, of course, true uh, in the cycling field. This is why on my next slide, I would like to introduce you to the fact that we are quite modest with our Practices. We collect best good and promising practices along three main criteria. And one being the problem solving capacity. Does, does the method, the strategy, um, the implementation of whatever solve a problem uh, in a sustainable way? And then two, is it transferable uh, from one setting to another, from one municipality to another, from one region to another? Usually, with modifications. Note that there is hardly ever uh, a copy-pasting possible of, of measures from one setting to another. We all live in different settings and cultures. And last, there should be good documentation. Everything goes from projects of EU, uh, uh, reports of EU projects uh, to grey literature at national level of research institutes. There must be something in writing so uh, some just anecdotal knowledge is not is not enough we need something tangible for uh, interested parties to hook on on my next slide therefore i would like to uh, make clear that it is all about getting the message across but not only showing finalized nice uh, implementations but showing the processes and the problems that were overcome we want hands-on descriptions make these solutions relatable what was the problem that was solved? How does the measure work, really? What triggered the implementation of the, of the measure? Who were the main actors? Who was involved? What were the political and public barriers? And how were they, how were they overcome? Are there any notions of positive impacts, or safety, um, life quality, any indications of the costs of the interventions? Are there references available, contacts where interested parties could make contact. It is important to, uh, to realize that um, implementations like the one on the, on the picture here taken from Vienna, large, uh, larger uh, schemes implementations often face uh, substantial opposition by local groups at political and public level. Once the implementation is there, and you ask afterwards, very, very um, often, Everybody is content, um, and nobody wants to, so 
sort of restart and go back to the original situation. So it's important that this is often not, not only a technical uh, process, it is much more a political and sociological process. So on my next slide, I would like to show you that we want to tackle all three levels of uh, cycling um, of cycling infrastructure implementation. It's not only the infrastructure level, but it's also the planning level and the strategic level. And uh, on my next slide, I would like to dwell a bit deeper on the infrastructure um, level. We are looking for design principles and concrete measures implementations in countries. We also look for their maintenance and last but not least, um, on the um, assessment of their safety. And you see some bad examples on the right side on top, on first, first row and some good practice implementations on second and third row. On uh, my next slide, I would like to go to the planning level. And as already, as Bostian has already uh, mentioned, uh, we look for um, networks that are cohesive, that are direct, that are safe, that are comfort, uh, comfortable and that are attractive. And we're looking for the planning process uh, processes to bring about such solutions. That there are there are very many um, good examples available at national levels, at EU project levels, and Eurovelo is of course a, a, a nice example. And on my next slide, I uh, would like to go to the third and last level, namely the strategic level. We're looking for strategies. At all at all levels, from from municipalities to uh, regional, uh, national and international, SUMPs, so the uh, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans, just one of the many buzzwords involved here. We also look for promotion and awareness solutions. We look for mainly national uh, legal precautions for cyclists. We look for solutions of seamless intermodality. You know, taking bikes on trains on the metros. We look for, so to say, collateral side effects of cycling, like health and on the environment. And last but not least, we are looking for policy development and evaluation tools. And that already takes me to my last slide. We will um, discuss in detail with stakeholders in all our member countries in the Danube areas, the measures, their problems, and these measures we were collecting in order to bring about real improvement in the Danube area. So. Thank you for uh, the attention. And back to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Klaus. And to summarize in a few words, everything that we are planning in the framework of the new Sabrina project, I'm passing the microphone once again to Olivera Rosi from the European Institute for Road Assessment, which is the lead partner in the Sabrina project, as well as also in the Radar project. Olivera, back to you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, everyone, once again. Uh, it's, we are close to the finalization of this conference, but I would like very briefly to put all what has be previously been uh, presented about uh, Sabrina into, a co uh, into the context and perspective of the project. Uh, Sabrina is, uh, stands for Safer Bicycle Routes in Danube Area. Sorry if you had some noise problems. Uh, it's a project just approved uh, in July and will last until December 2022, uh, hopefully. Uh, it's uh, one of the projects that uh, is uh, approved by the third uh, call of the Danube Transnational Programme in the middle of the COVID crisis and we are really going to look very hard to solutions how to um, the, uh, implement the project. Uh, last uh, uh, yesterday we have heard that one conference again presenting about the project in, in cycling that they don't know how to uh, how they will implement the project. And to be honest, this is actually uh, how we feel at this moment. Uh, there are so many plans uh, and so many uh, motivations to do this project, and we are really really looking forward to find the ways to overcome the project, the the, the constraints. Sorry. In a nutshell, uh, Sabrina will increase stakeholders' capacity in all stages of decision-making when it comes to safer infrastructure for bicycles. It will build up knowledge and cooperation at different levels, and it will prevent development 
or killer cycling infrastructure in early stage of, de of development. I think that this third part is something that we are really, really concerned uh, in both road infrastructure safety for car uh, occupants, uh, but also for cycling. We don't want as a project, any project and as a lead partner to see any new infrastructure built that will kill people. This has been uh, the case in so many countries uh, and also in Europe and in our region. And we really believe that by our actions, we will be able to contribute toward that goal. Uh, there, will be, there has been a lot of statistics shown during this uh, first Sabrina presentation, so I won't uh, stay long on this. Uh, everything is understandable. More cycling on road, there will be more facilities. We need to address it early, especially we need to address it early, uh, as shown in the video, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure for, for bicycles uh, in Danube area countries. Uh, has a huge room for improvement in uh, all uh, levels, engineering, strategic and political as well. Um, this is also to show that in the Danube region, in respect, in comparison to other Western European countries, we still have uh, a problem, even though the cycling is not the, as represented as in share of other uh, use of transport modes as in the Western European countries. So we can expect that in the future the problem will be uh, growing if uh, no measures uh, had been uh, in place between uh, in this developing period, especially in post-COVID area, which demonstrated that we need to go uh, further steps uh, in order to ensure that bicycles facilities are present and people can bike safely. Uh, this here are the four component parts of uh, our project. Uh, you heard about inspection and safety ratings of bicycle routes. We are going to do good practice analysis as presented by, um, by our uh, dear friend uh, Klaus. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about strategic decision-making tool and pilots and trainings that we are going to implement. To go into details, uh, not very detailed, of course, because of the time, um, in uh, inspection and safety rating of bicycle routes working package, we are going to uh, define, or actually we have already defined the network, uh, that we want to expect, we inspect, we just want to see how we are going to be able to do this given the constraints of COVID. Uh, we are going to prepare the maps of the network and then do inspections and coding, analyze the reports and produce safety ratings of routes that we have uh, surveyed. It's going to be approximately 5,000 kilometers of road in all participating countries covering parts of each Eurovelo route that is, uh, this is passing through the region. And at the end, we are going to have a, a couple of meetings uh, in attempt to uh, do what uh, Marco and Alexander has presented, uh, something that we call methodologies methodology capitalization, meaning trying to find a way to integrate this existing methodology into something meaningful, easy to use, and ready to use to, uh, for stakeholders. In the next uh, slide, you see the outputs. We are going to produce a star rating map, uh, like this one, which is a car occupant star rating map produced in the previous project a couple of years ago. And we are also, also going to have the inspection database. All these outputs will, of course, be, as always, uh, publicly available to anyone interesting, interested. Uh, uh, from the perspective of good practice analysis, Klaus has explained a lot of details. I will just say we are going to do analysis of data collection, data collected during surveys. Uh, we are going to do a desktop research and uh, we are going, of course, as Klaus mentioned in his last uh, slide, we are going to do a stakeholder consultation because what matters most is that our project is designed to the need of stakeholders and we meet them to the, way, to the level where they are. Uh, we are going to produce a fact sheet, recommendation and national consultation reports in this respect. Uh, one of the biggest output uh, of the project and uh, most uh, interesting part is the strategic decision-making toolkit, toolkit, which will be one uh, platform, online platform, uh, that will uh, called Safe Cycling Routes Toolkit. Uh, it will provide users and for the users, stakeholders, uh, national, uh, local, regional level authorities, engineers, uh, uh, with cycling infrastructure, uh, and uh, 
uh, enable them to select recommended strategies and countermeasures for bicycle road safety improvements. Uh, finally, uh, in the pilots and trainings, this will, uh, this will be the activity which is very important and will actually uh, uh, summarize all the activities that we are going to do and pass this knowledge uh, further to stakeholders. Uh, we will combine trainings and pilot actions to demonstrate the previously mentioned Safer Cycling Route Toolkit. Uh, in this, we are going to do uh, three pilots in each country, one uh, missing link planning, uh, uh, star rating of design uh, of bicycle infrastructure and Safer cycle, uh, Cycling Infrastructure pilot. More about that will follow. This is the kickoff conference. All my colleagues have previously very well presented the project and the most important part of the project. We would like to uh, turn the spotlight to our website to ask you and invite you actually to uh, submit to our newsletter and uh, uh, join us on this journey to improve uh, cycling infrastructure in the region. Thank you very much. Anya, back to you. Thank you very much, Olivera, for this overview. And since the time for our conference is slowly but surely running out, we check the questions that were posted during the conference. There is a lot of them. A reminder once again, they will be posted on our websites and please make sure you go and check the answers in the written form there. But there is a lot of questions that have kind of like the same spirit. So we will try to capture the nature of all of them in one question and ask our presenters uh, to answer it in the next minute or two. So there was a lot of questions in the sense, how can we make sure that the ro rural road safety data will be more reliable? How can we achieve that? So whoever is ready to answer, please feel free to unmute yourself. Maybe Marco or Jure. Yeah, Anya, if I may suggest, uh, Oliver, speaking to give uh, the floor to one of our uh, senior please. engineers, maybe Boyan would like to comment because I see there is another Boyan? question again about data collection. Uh, that we will, of course, treat uh, uh, in written. Uh, anyone else? Please feel free to unmute and just respond. How we can improve the data? Yeah, I can maybe answer to that. Um, um, yeah, uh, data, of course, is 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 uh, the most important part of of every model or every. Uh, management system. So, so if you have uh, wrong data uh, in the input, you will have wrong conclusions in the output, and that's that's of course uh, crucial. Many countries are um, having different approaches uh, in how to collect the data, and um, of course uh, that's why international cooperation, the sharing of uh, know-how, best practices uh, is important. And uh, within within Sabrina, uh, the, 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 with, with the link of uh, different uh, um, inputs from different methodologies of collecting the data, we will come to, to also the recommendations for a future way on how to uh, uh, define uh, these data sources in a way that uh, they could potentially be extracted from uh, other means of uh, date, databases. So, so for example, we know that uh, the road user uh, or road management uh, companies, uh, road operators, they hold the asset management data, which is of course extremely important uh, if you want to assess the road infrastructure. And of course, you have usually the police that hold the extent data. So those two, in a way, should be linked together in a, in a consistent way. And uh, Sabrina will also deal with that in the future. Back to you, Anya. Thank you so much, Marco. As mentioned, all the other questions will be posted online. And to finish with this conference, uh, we would like to 
ask you for a, a little favor. Your feedback is very important to us. So please stay on the line and there will be a little, a very short evaluation form with a few questions. A pop-up screen will show up. So please just fill it out and we will really appreciate. So thank you all, all, already in advance for your feedback. So at the moment, you can see on the screen all the links for the websites of both projects that were presented today, as well as the social media profiles and the contacts. So feel free to follow us and join us on this journey towards the safer infrastructure for all road users. Big thank you once again to all of our speakers, organizers of the conference, and of course, big thank you to you, dear participants, for joining us today and for showing your interest and your passion for road infrastructure safety. If we say just these two words, road and infrastructure, they might not sound as a very interesting topic, but if road infrastructure is planned and executed properly, it can save lives. What is more important than that? Stay safe out there and hopefully see you soon.